Uh, well, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, hope you, you like this talk. Let's just get started. So today I'm going to be talking about optimizing compilation times with C++ templates. I know it sounds super counterintuitive, but uh, hopefully after I go through this talk, you guys are going to get an understanding of what's going on and the things that I did to optimize it. And just a little bit about myself. My name is Eddie Elizondo. I work for Facebook. Specifically, I work on Thrift, which is our internal RPC framework. And compilation times are definitely not my full-time job. This is just something that I, uh, you know, I was tinkering around with the code in, in, in Facebook, and I found these optimizations, and initially I didn't know what was going on. But, uh, you know, I built some machinery and some tools that uh, gave me the understanding of what was going on behind the scenes with uh, template instantiations, and hopefully you guys are gonna be able to leverage that uh, in your code bases to get this information as well. So, Let's just start with some, some history. So we've, we've all heard that story about how templates are really slow to compile. And some other times, like my, one of my uh, judges for you know, deciding if I was gonna present here or not said that compilation times is an ad hoc process. What that means is that there's no scientific or not, not a concrete way to measure the compilation times of your units, of your translation units. And by saying that it's an ad hoc process, it says that it doesn't, we don't have any tools to uh, accurately measure these kinds of things. But hopefully after this talk, I'm gonna prove those things wrong. So before we start, uh, I wanna ask you a couple questions. The first one is, do you know which is the slowest compilation unit in your entire build system? And the reason why I'm asking this, it's because you know this is like an 80-20 problem. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, by listening to Dimitri's talk that, that we had yesterday about uh, techniques for improving build times, we hear about caching, caching your, your compilation units and having in incremental builds. And by having that, you're gonna be solving most of the problems that you have with uh, you know, compile times. But if you wanna go even further, if you wanna dive down into even improving uh, that extra 20%, then this talk is definitely for you. So the second question is, do you know how much time it takes to instantiate all the templates in the slowest compilation unit that you have in your build system? And you know the reason why I'm focusing so much on instantiation times, uh, template instantiation times, it's because from experience, what I found out is that if you have a really slow compilation unit, it usually means that your templates are blowing up somewhere and you don't even know it. And Furthermore, do you know, out of those templates that are taking too much time to instantiate, do you know which is the slowest template that's uh, you know, slowing or bottlenecking the entire compilation unit in that translation uh, unit? So in this talk, we're gonna be addressing the latter two points. So let's just start with a really quick overview of what C++ templates are, and specifically about how template instantiation works. So we all start with our source file, our .cpp file. And the first thing that happens is that you pass that source file to your uh, front end, your compiler front end. Now, I'm gonna be focusing right now on Clang because that's where I build my tools in and it's, it's really easy to expand Clang and add your own tools. But after applying the optimizations, they not only apply to Clang but also GCC and any other compiler that, that you use for your build system. <laughs> so let's keep going with uh, LLVM and Clang for now. So you pass that to your front end. The first step is that you're gonna start lexing your source code. And I'm not gonna dive that deep into here, it's just you need to understand that the lexing part is just tokenizing uh, your entire source code. Now the next step is that the lexer passes that to the parsing stage. And the parsing stage does a couple of things. So for example, whenever you have a, a source file, it's gonna have some includes if, if you have any. And what's happening is that uh, the parser is gonna go and find those headers and it's gonna copy and paste those on top of your .cpp file. And it does uh, that recursively. So if you have more includes and an include that you have, it's gonna do that and at the end, you're gonna end up with all the headers uh, copy and pasted on top of your .cpp file. After that, uh, then the parser is gonna start actually parsing your source code. The next thing that happens is that at some point, if you have templates in your source code, what's gonna happen is that, you know, you're gonna find something like this. So Fibonacci 80 that you're trying to assign that to the value X. After you find that, then the parser is gonna start the template instantiation phase. And, uh, you know, it will do that recursively in this case for Fibonacci, and after it finishes instantiating all the templates and parsing everything in your source code, then it's gonna go on and pass that to the optimizer, to LVM. Uh, to do the optimization steps and finish the compilation. 
Now let's dive a little bit deeper into the template instantiation phase. So let's start with an example. In this case, we're gonna use Fibonacci as an example. Uh, that's a really simple implementation and I'm just missing the base cases, but you get the idea of how Fibonacci is implemented with templates. And in this case, we're gonna have an a.cpp file, which is gonna include that, uh, that header. And we're gonna go through to the example that we had before. So we have Fibonacci 80 that we're trying to assign that to the variable x. Now, as I mentioned before, the parser is gonna come in, it's gonna include uh, the header into this source file. And after that, it's gonna find Fibonacci 80, which in turn is gonna uh, turn to the template instantiation phase. What's gonna happen is that once you start that phase, then it's gonna start instantiating all the templates, and in this case, uh, you know, Fibonacci is calling itself, so it's gonna recursively call itself until it goes to the base case, and once it finishes that, and it return, then it returns a value to the variable x. Now, the really key point in here is that templates are memoized or cached for every translation unit. That means that, you know, if you get another variable that you're trying to assign a value from a template that you've already instantiated before, then you don't need to roll out or instantiate all of those templates anymore. You already have them in your source files. So what happens in here is that you're trying to instantiate Fibonacci 40, but you already instantiated that before with the previous variable. So what it does now is that it just goes and picks up Fibonacci 40 and gives it to the variable Y without having to instantiate anything anymore because you already have it. But let's just be really clear that this just happens within the same translation unit that is within just one .cpp file. Even if you have another CPP file, which is part of the same library that you're using, like in, this in this case, we have another example. So b.cpp, which is trying to assign Fibonacci 40 to the variable z. Now, for this translation unit, it doesn't know anything about the other translation unit, uh, or specifically about the templates in the other translation unit. So what happens here is that z has to go and instantiate all the 40 uh, templates that it needs to get, to get its value. It cannot use what it already instantiated in the other transition unit. So I just wanna make really clear that memoization or caching in the templates only happen within the same transition unit. So let's go into the measuring tools and uh, how we go about measuring compile times and specifically how do we drill down uh, into specific parts of the compilation process. And I just wanna mention that if you guys wanna use any of these tools, uh, I've tried to upstream them to, uh, to Clang and to LLVM, but uh, hit some uh, blocks here and there. But I've been trying to, uh, I'm gonna at some point upstream them, but if you wanna use them right away, my GitHub, my GitHub is in there. You can just go in and run my scripts to patch Clang and uh, build it yourself. So let's just start with a demo of how this looks like. Um, so I hope this is not too small, but what's happening at the top is that uh, I'm gonna open up really quick the example that I was using before of Fibonacci. So I just wanna show you the implementation of this. In the top part, you're gonna see the implementation of Fibonacci. Now in the bottom part, you're gonna see that I'm assigning Fibonacci 80 to the variable x. All right, so that's our source file. What's gonna happen now is that uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass this flag to Clang, it's called F time report. And what that does is that it gives us a report of the overall uh, process that it happens in the, in the compiler. As you can see, we get a report on the front end time. So it gives us how much time it takes to do the whole front end part. For the, in this case, for the Fibonacci 80 example. Not only that, but we also get some more granular information. Uh, for example, this is something that I added, the template instantiation time. So it gives you the time that it takes to instantiate all the templates within that translation unit. And pre-processing is something that one of my coworkers also created. Uh, we haven't been able to upstream that to Clang, but at some point we're gonna do it. And you know, you get all of this information of what's going on in the front end. Not only that, but we also get some more information about what's going on in the back end. So as you can see, if we move past uh, the front end part, you get all the optimization steps that are happening in your translation unit. You know, so if you run different optimization flags, in this case, O0 or O3, you're gonna get different steps. And, and when you run the most optimized uh, build, you're gonna get even more steps than what we have right now. But it gives you an understanding of what's going on. And even with just this information on the back end, this one time I was able to find some inlining issues in my compilation unit, and by just changing some lines here or there, I was able to improve uh, like 10% of the compile time of that unit, just by looking at this information. 
And then once uh, you know, we drill down into that, and we actually want to go a step further, and wanna, we want to understand uh, how much time every template it, it's taking in the compilation unit, then for that, we use another tool, which is called template. So template is just a wrapper around Clang. And what it does is that uh, you, know, you pass the correct flags that you need to pass into that. And what it does is that it just, every time that you're instantiating a template, it's taking that and it's recording it. So after you run the first uh, tool, the template tool, then it gives you a tracing information, which uh, I just uh, pass some scripts to get the final result, which is, in this case, the instantiation times for Fibonacci. And if we open that up, we're gonna see that we get the result of the time that it takes to instantiate every template. And you know, after you have this, uh, in this case, I'm just sorting them uh, by the order of how they were instantiated, but you can apply more fancy uh, you know, sorting algorithms or something to sort them by the time that it takes to instantiate them. And once we have this information, it will tell us the things that we need to focus on to improve our compile times within our system. Now, just a little bit on the stuff that I work at. So, I work with Thrift, which is our internal framework to do RPCs. That is, to communicate any client to any given server. And the way that we achieve that, it's by having an interface definition language where we define all the structs that are gonna be used by our clients and our servers. And the way that we achieve that is that we automatically generate the code to serialize and deserialize structs on the client or on the server side. So if you follow the flow from here, you have a client which then serializes it, uh, serialize any given struct to a wire format which we then send over the network and on the other side, the server deserializes it and reads the information and then after it processes information, then it gives it back to the client. But the important part here is that we automatically generate the code to serialize and deserialize these structs. Now, you know, we have this piece of framework, but then a lot of engineers started complaining that Thrift was really slow to compile. And it was pretty obvious because any time that you were trying to use a translation unit that had Thrift, then uh, compile times would just explode. So we're gonna go back and use the tools that I already presented to try to figure out why that's, go like why that's happening and attempt to fix that. So let's start with uh, FTime Report, which I already showed you before. And after running that in our system, it gave me a result that looks something like this. So out of the total time, out of the 100% of the front end time, 86% of the time was being spent on, spent on template instantiation times. And as I said before, uh, generally if you have a compilation unit that's taking too long, it, means, it usually means that your templates are exploding somewhere. And that was happening in our, in our uh, generated files. And not only that, but we also get some more information on the back end. And I'm showing this right now because I'm gonna come back at this at the end to uh, show some improvements that happen from improving compile times. Uh, all right, so once we know that templates are really slow to instantiate in our unit, the next step is to use template to drill down into every template to see what's going on. So after running template uh, in the generated code that we had, we get a result that looked something like this. So out of the total time, out of that 350 seconds, 60 was spent on just instantiated that one template. That is 20% of the time was just being spent on instantiating just one template. Now that's not acceptable, and we need to go and figure out what's going on with that read function to understand why that's taking too long. And as you can see, that's not, only the, that's not just the only result we got, it was more about 12 different uh, lines that told us all the templates that were being instantiated within that unit. All right, so the next step is to try to figure out what's causing this problem. Let's go back and um, understand the interface definition language that I talked about before. So in this case, if you uh, look on the left side on struct 28, and if you see field 15, you're gonna see a, a list of integer 32s. What that means is that, you know, every time that we're trying to serialize or deserialize that field, we will be generating something that looked like this. Now, this is not exactly how the code looks like. I'm gonna go to that in a minute. This is just to illustrate the example of uh, how that algorithm sort of looked like in generated code. Now, if we see field 76, we have a nested uh, list of integer 32s. So we have a list of lists of i32s. What that means is that whenever we're trying to deserialize this field, internally, 
we'll be just repeating the same code that we already had before from field 15. That meant that we were doing exactly the same thing for every template, uh, for every field that we already had in our interface definition language. So in this case, this is a really good clue that, you know, we can apply some generic functions to abstract these things out to not be repeating ourselves whenever we don't need it. And now we have our hypothesis. So by creating a templated library, we'll be able to memoize uh, the instantiated templates, and that in turn, we're gonna reduce the amount of code that the compiler needs to handle. And by reducing the amount of code that the compiler needs to handle, then in turn, we're gonna have faster compilation unit. So let's try to, uh, you know, uh, go through this example to see if our hypothesis is actually true. Let's just jump in into a little bit of meta programming. Now, I'm just, I'm just gonna say right now that I'm not gonna focus on a lot of techniques that you can use to, uh, you know, improve compile times and with, with templates. And the reason it's because there have been so many talks about templates in this, uh, in this week that you can go to other talks that are focused just on templates and you can see other techniques that people use to get around this problem. I'm just gonna show you the technique that I specifically use to improve our problem. Now, the first attempt to create this generic library was to use Feeny. And as, I mean, for any generic problem, that's usually the first approach that you need to try. And what that means is that for every uh, type that you have, you have an enable if to try to determine if that's the correct template that you need to instantiate to deserialize the correct struct in our case. And the way that you use it, it's on the bottom left, you know, you call the read function with the unit that you're trying to, with, with the type that you're trying to uh, deserialize. And what's happening now is that, uh, you know, for every type that we have, we're going through all the templates that we have and checking all the enable ifs to make sure that it's the right template to instantiate. Now that's a problem. And the reason it's because that's a linear time template overload resolution. What that means is that for all the 12 different types that we have, we were checking the 12 different enable ifs to make sure we were instantiated the right one. Now after attempting this, it turns out that it was actually slower than what we already had before for our compilation unit. And as you know, you cannot ship anything to production that's slower than what you already have. So we need to be faster. And it turns out that we can actually improve these enable ifs to uh, you know, change it from linear time to constant time overload resolution. And the way that we achieve that, it's by using type tagging. What that means is that we use empty structs and they're gonna be serving as uh, tags to be able to find the correct overload resolution to do that in linear time, in constant time, I mean. And the way that that looks like is that now we got rid of the enable ifs and in turn, we have uh, these type classes that are gonna help us jump to the correct template instantiation. And as you can see the usage on the bottom right, we insert the metadata that we have from our interface information language into the usage of this template to be able to instantiate to the correct one every time that we need it. So we turn out that linear problem into a constant problem. And as I mentioned before, I'm not gonna be uh, going into other attempts that I, that I did to improve uh, compile time specifically with templates because there's so many talks that already talked about uh, the stuff that I wanted to talk about but I'm just gonna focus on the results that applying this approach gave me. So if we check out how this uh, turned out to be, now this is a nice representation and a graph of what I showed you before. So on the left side, you have the total time that it takes to instantiate all the templates in the original um, thing that I showed you at the beginning. And now what I'm gonna show you is after applying this type tagging, uh, how it looks like now. And that's the result. So it's just a fraction of the total time. And if you're wondering why we don't have any more yellow lines on the other, uh, you know, number one, number two, number three, the reason is because now they're so small that they're not even showing up in this graph. All right, so now, we have, now that we have this information, let's take a step back and see how this affected the overall compilation unit. On the left side, you have the original approach that we had, so uh, you know, generating the entire code for deserializing every struct, and that's what I showed you before. Now, on the right side, you're gonna see the new approach that I had by using the tags, the type tagging. As you can see, template instantiation time dropped by an order of magnitude. And not only that, but this has a trickling effect on the entire front end and even the back end. 
So as you can see, now the compiler needs to handle less code. So the code generation time is now uh, faster than one of what, what it was before, because now you have less code that you need to handle. So as you can see, the total time now dramatically uh, improve. Not even, it's, it's not only the front end time, but also the back end time. As you can see, now that we have less code to handle, the back end is able to perform even faster. So if you think about improving your template instantiation times, it's gonna have an impact on the overall compilation unit. Now let's check the code to see what it looks like with this new templated approach. Now the reason why the, the fun is a little bit smaller in here, it's because you don't need to actually read the code, you just need to see how it looks like. On the left side, we have the original approach of deserializing the entire struct, and on the right side, we have the new approach. So in a minute, uh, on the left side, I'm gonna roll down to, uh, wait, give it a second, there it is. So that entire page, it's just deserializing one field. As you can see, that first case, all of that is deserializing one field. Now, I collapse all of that into this single line, which includes all the metadata that it needs to go into the generic library to deserialize it correctly. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is just one function call. Uh, it just has all the metadata within the template brackets. All right, so why do we care about this? Why should we care about template instantiation times, and in general, about compilation times? And I know I'm gonna be stealing one of uh, Dimitri's jokes, but this is really important. At every company, uh, whenever we're waiting on compilation times, it's just wasted time, time that we can spend you know, iterating faster, or even uh, you know, improving our code, or getting results faster. You know, it's, it's never fun to just wait on your compilation times, and you know, if we can do something to improve that, we're not gonna be improving ourselves and the time that we take to iterate, but we're gonna be improving everyone in our company, and by enabling them to uh, you know, not be waiting on compile times, we're gonna be enabling them to move faster and to iterate faster and get faster results. So that's why we should care about template instantiation times. And hopefully with this talk, uh, you, know, you gain an insight of how to get these metrics and how to dive down into every template that you're instantiating to figure out what are the correct things and the correct actions to take to improve uh, the compile times within every unit that you have. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? If so, the question is if we tried if const expression. And the answer is no, because uh, the reason why we didn't try that is because we don't have all the information beforehand. So the thing is that uh, every time that people are trying to uh, you know, serialize and deserialize, they're sending that information, and we need to be doing that at runtime. So we don't have the entire information at compile time, we just have some of the information. That's why we use the metadata from the interface definition language to inject it into our templates. Hi. Uh, so have you found any runtime performance differences? Because now you've taken this inline code and you put a new separate function. Yeah. So actually, after applying this result, uh, I actually got improvements in runtime. So it was around, well, depending on the, on the thing that you were measuring, so I measured this with ads, and uh, with ads, it turned out that it was able to serialize and deserialize stuff around 5% faster than what I already had before. And the reason for this is because the uh, optimization part, it's now doing a better job at optimizing those uh, smaller pieces of code. So yeah, there's a runtime improvement. And just to mention uh, something extra, uh, the results that you saw in here were examples that I created for this talk. I applied this internally at Facebook, and I reduced a compile time of something that was taking around 800 seconds to 400. So 50% improvement on the slowest compilation unit in our build system. So runtime and build time improvements. So why did you template the class PM in that one example rather than templating the actual read and write functions? Oh, so the question is why did I template the, the PM and I didn't template the read and write functions? The reason it's because that's actually something that I wanna uh, try next. The reason why I didn't do that, it's because we need some extra information from, 
all the fields that we have. If we wanted to implement that right now, we would need to do some sort of reflection. And the first attempt that we did at reflection, it was taking too long to instantiate all the things that it needed. And the reason we need reflection is because sometimes we need to inject uh, information about the field or information about the type of the field. Uh, so trying to do reflection on the object was really costly in, in compilation times. But the next approach that I'm gonna try is to do some sort of pseudo reflection. So what if, uh, you know, on my compilation unit, I inject some extra information that I can pass into the template that gives me information about every field and every type. So now I don't need to reflect on the object, but I just read that metadata that, inject, that I inject into my uh, CPP file. Any other questions? Sort of a comment question. Um, I've found that, uh, so one thing I think is important to mention is that the template is, that's the patched compiler, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there have been things like that in the past and they, because they don't get upstream, they, they fall behind. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, um, oh, so you didn't mention anything about uh, explicit instantiations or extern uh, templates. Did you have any experience with that, or, yes. or as using it as a tool to measure, or or even uh, to in your end result? Yeah. So that's actually something that we also leverage. Uh, I didn't dive that that much into it, but it turns out that uh, in the files that we generate for serialization, and deserialization, every time that we're trying to use the read and write functions. So in this case, an example is going to be. Uh, you know, if you have another struct that depends on one of the other structs that you already have, every time that it saw that, it was attempting to do some instantiations. And the way that we improve that, it's by having the extern to just instantiate it once and be able to leverage that to not repeat the process I already did before. So yes, we do that and that actually helps with compile times. But the thing with that is, the thing why I didn't mention it, it's because you gotta be really careful because I started overusing it and it actually worsened uh, the compile times. So that's why you need to be using these tools to uh, actively measure the time that it takes to instantiate everything, because you might think that something is improving it, while in reality it's not. <laughs> from, from my experience, when you, and I think this is correct, when you do the extern of a template, it still does the full AST, it full, does the full type expansion in the AST, it just doesn't generate the code uh, on the back end. So yeah, if you spam, extern templates, you're doing a ton of extra AST work. Yeah. Um, I also found that was an interesting way without, without using a patch compiler to get an idea of, is my time going into the AST section of things or the, the, the code generation? Yeah. And for my particular example, I found out it was, for me it was about 50-50, and so I had to be very careful. Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing, like now you, uh, the idea with these tools is that it will give you all the information that you need uh, you know, right away. You don't need to be playing around with then like adding something or removing something to see that it works. But yeah, you're definitely true. Uh, we should not be spamming by using extern. Uh, this will be our, our last question. Sounds good. Uh, so you showed the results for Clang. Does it uh, uh, apply to GCC as well? I mean, they compile time improvements. Yes, so I applied the same thing to GCC and it turns out that it actually improved uh, the compile time in GCC as well. Uh, the reason why I didn't show that it's because the tools that I built were for Clang. Uh, that gave me the most information about the results that I got. But the overall uh, compilation time in GCC also improved by quite some, um, quite some bit. All right, well thanks a lot.